So welcome everybody to our seminar series and our March seminar for 2024. I think you'll all be really delighted to actually know that we have a seminar which focus on, focuses on two key aspects of the Royal Commission's final report and implications for people with intellectual disabilities group homes and inclusive school education. We have two fabulous presenters today. We're very lucky to have Professor Chris Bigby as our first speaker and Professor Teresa Iacono as our second speaker. They will both consider the evidence heard by the Royal Commission and its conclusions and, and critique the recommendations. Our process is the same as usual. However, let me just remind you, if you would like to use closed captions, then you can add closed captions by clicking on the more button on the right bottom side of the screen. Okay, so I think again, the same process, we're going to be adding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, we're going to be adding questions to the, the Q and A. Q &A. Yeah, just checking. Okay. And our speakers will be very good and speak for 35 or so, maybe 30 minutes, a little bit more so that we can have plenty of time for questions. And those questions, as, as we just noted, go into the Q&A. So it's with great pleasure I welcome you, Chris. I think Professor Chris Bigby is known to you all. Chris is the director of the Living with Disability Research Centre at the Tribe University and has done a huge amount of work in, in the area that really, um, particularly with people with intellectual disability, that is so important. This afternoon, she's going to talk about a critical review of the approach to group homes taken, to the dis taken by the Disability Royal Commission. Thanks, Chris. Over to you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jacinta. Um, so Jacinta's explained what I'm going to do, but just to start off, I'm just going to spend a few minutes just uh, providing a slight bit of background to the Disability Royal Commission, just in case anybody isn't across it. Um, most people will be familiar with the Royal Commission, which ran from April 2019 before the world changed to September 2023. And, and it had a really broad brief uh, that it was to look at the experiences of people with disabilities and the causes of harm to them. Um, it was to look at uh, prevention of harm, abuse, violence, and exploitation, and to promote ways of promoting a more inclusive society. And that meant both looking at the really bad things that happened to people with, with disabilities and why they happened, but also exploring the types of quality services and things that need to change more structurally um, that might lead to a good life and a more inclusive society. It had an amazingly broad focus. So it focused across all aspects of the life course, across all life domains, which meant it went across service sectors. It was what we call de-differentiated. So it wasn't looking at any particular group of people with disabilities. It was looking at all people with disabilities, although as it went through it, it honed in on some particular groups and it was rooted in a human rights approach. And that was very clear from the outset. So it went around, it, it went about its business in, in terms of collect, undertaking an inquiry and collecting evidence, sifting that evidence and reaching conclusions and then recommendations. Um, the figures are really quite staggering. It held, you know, almost 2000 private sessions where it heard from people. Um, it held public hearings, which were often two or three days. Uh, with many witnesses, and from some of those hearings, it produced hearing reports. It invited people to write submissions, um, and everybody that was part of a hearing usually provided an, a submission as well, or which was known as an exhibit. 
Um, it commissioned uh, 27 research reports and published 14 issues papers. In addition to that, it had 12 volumes uh, in its final report uh, and it made 222 recommendations. And you could probably spend the next month or so going around the website, which holds all of that material and digging into it. Um, so there's a, there's a wealth of information there about its work, what it heard, what its conclusions are. Um, and it cost an enormous amount of money. And I think, you know, there's some reflection to be had about was this valuable? And we'll only know that, I think, in terms of the longer term outcomes uh, from this huge piece of work. So that's just to give you a sort of background. And if anyone wants to dig into it, then I recommend doing it. It's it's all there. It's relatively easy to find. Um, but I'm going to focus today on what the Royal Commission looked at in relation to group homes. So I'm going to look at its the stance that it took, um, how it collected evidence, and the recommendations uh, that it that it made. Um, and to some extent, just try and link some of those to the NDIS review, which came out after the Royal Commission. So what I did basically was spent a lot of time looking at the material that's on the Royal Commission's website um, and interrogated it really in terms of how it approached group homes, the questions that were asked, the evidence that it heard and its conclusions. <coughs> And my focus was in particular on people with intellectual disabilities, um, people living in group homes and their everyday lives. So I didn't look at the broader issues around service regulation in general or housing in general. Um, and the reason really why I focused on group homes was that more than half of the people who live in group homes are people with intellectual disabilities. Group homes have been the mainstay of of alternative support and accommodation for people with intellectual disabilities other than their families. So it really has been a system of group homes that was created for that group of people when institutions closed. So they've always been the dominant group. Um, and many of the people that are currently living in group homes transferred to the NDIS from the old state systems of services. And many of them have been that came out of institutions and have been in group homes for a long time. Clearly, there's 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 more recent group homes that have been built, which have been uh, where people with other types of disabilities have started to live. Um, but I focused in particular on this group of people. So to start off with, what did the DRC, how did the DRC approach group homes? And it was very clear from the outset that it prioritised uh, looking at group homes because it felt the significance of home as a place for people to feel safe, where people should be safe. Um, and they recognised the barriers for people who were living in group homes of engaging with the Commission. And so they, they did a lot of outreach work. They funded advocacy groups to, to go and find people who would be able to provide evidence to them. So they didn't just wait for people to come to them. They did some outreach work. And that was clear in the private testimonies that they heard primarily from, from parents and family members of people with intellectual disabilities who were living in group homes. They published um, what I would say was a fairly cursory overview of group homes and the issues in a paper that was only nine pages long. Um, and that then they and they invited people to to provide input and to comment on those issues and there was a report that summarizes those responses. Um, there were lots of submissions uh, over the period of the time that included issues around group homes. There was a dedicated hearing, uh, which was called hearing number three, which was held on the 2nd to the 6th of December, 2019 in Melbourne. And at that hearing, there were 29 witnesses um, that spoke in person. It was before COVID. Um, and so it was it was sort of one of the it was online, it was streamed, but it was mainly in person. Um, and I should say I was one of the witnesses at that hearing. And then there was a report that was produced of the hearing. Um, but clearly, if you go through the other hearings um, and look at the case studies in those hearings, many of them 
rel included uh, references to and case studies of people that were living in group homes. So there was a dedicated focus, but then it was included in amongst uh, the broader consideration of the intellect of the disability service system. And if you look at, at all that material, there's two things that jumped out to me um, was that there were two themes happening. There was the question of looking at the model itself. Is this group home model a model that's fundamentally flawed? Um, is it a viable model? Should it be part of the service system? And what might be the alternatives to it? Um, or is this a model that is just badly implemented? And could it be improved? Things like culture, staff skills, performance, uh, and monitoring. If we fix those things up, would the model be okay? So there's sort of two strands of evidence running through. And interestingly enough, those were the that those were the very themes that have been running through the literature uh, for a long time. Um, so in terms of the evidence that the Royal Commission heard. It heard from people from many different perspectives. It heard from people with intellectual disabilities themselves, quite a number of self-advocates. It heard uh, from family members, from service providers, um, from a range of advocates, people representing peak bodies, advocacy organisations, heard from academics, um, and it heard from people from the NDIA, the NDIS, and other government agencies. If you look at many of the submissions that were made, they people put their own points of view, but also many of the peak bodies and advocacy groups drew on evidence from research and made reference to the existing knowledge that we had about group homes. But it was very interesting, I think, that unlike other areas of the DRC, um, they didn't commission any research, particularly on group homes. So for supported decision making, there was a specific research commissioned for inclusion for uh, special schools, education. There was research that was commissioned, but there was nothing commissioned about group homes. So there was no sort of underlying um, place where all the evidence was brought together or new research was undertaken about this issue. Most of the evidence uh, that was heard or that was received was descriptive of some of the very negative experiences and the negative impact of various aspects of group homes. Um, and you can't, can't get away from that. There were some very graphic, very harrowing accounts of the type of abuse um, that happened in group homes and the neglect of people and the very, very low quality of life that people lived in group homes. Um, and, you know, it's it's really hard to to read a lot of those very detailed descriptions in particular that came from family members. And I've put some quotes along the way in this presentation, but I'm not I'm not going to uh, repeat them because I think they're still uh, fairly harrowing for many people to hear. There was also evidence um, about the variability of group homes the variability over time as staff changed and as providers changed. So many of the family members talked about, well, it was all right then, and then a staff member left, or then the pro provider changed, and then the service got worse. So there was this sense of variability over time. Um, the evidence talked a lot about the problems of implementation and it was seen that group homes were part of some of the broader systemic issues around disability services in general. Um, and this is a quote from one of the, from hearing three, which talks about violence and abuse of people with disabilities being widespread and not simply confined to group homes, um, but then goes on to suggest that group homes in particular um, replicate many of those systemic issues that are found in disability services and that they come from cultural governance and workforce issues. Um, and there was a lot of focus on the failure of organizations to deliver services um, that would ensure people's safety and that would ensure quality of support. And there was a lot of attention given to poor staff practice, poor staff supervision, poor staff training, or leadership and culture. 
But there was also a lot of attention given to some of the wider systemic issues about the resource scarcity in the past that had led to crisis placements in, of people in group homes, and some of that's still happening, and therefore the very ill-matched households um, that often had resulted. So people were living with other people um, that may cause them harm, and that was certainly not compatible with them. And that was seen to be a product of that sort of the resource scarcity that had happened prior to the NDIS. There was a, evidence too about the isolation of people that lived in group homes um, and their limited social networks, their limited access to advocacy, particularly many of the people that had come out of institutions that didn't have close relationships to families. And there was a sense that the isolation of people um, and the segregation of group homes to some extent created living situations where people were made more vulnerable to abuse. So those situations created uh, a vulnerability to abuse because uh, nobody else was coming in from outside. People didn't have anybody uh, monitoring what was happening to them. And it was felt that that was also compounded by the failure of disability service organizations to act on complaints or investigations. Um, and the, the sense that it's just people with intellectual disabilities and they're not able to give evidence, so we're not able to follow through and investigate and take ex action about abuse. There was there was a lot of, of attention and evidence about uh, group homes being a flawed model that were beyond any form of remediation and shouldn't be in the disability service system at all. And a lot of this evidence about the flawed model rested on theoretical propositions uh, from rights theory rather than empirical evidence. So there were three terms that were used uh, in relation to group homes that they were segregated, um, that on the basis that you had to have an impairment, that the impairment determined where you live um, and there were no other alternatives. So they were a segregated service that only included people with intellectual disabilities or other types of disabilities. that they were closed environments where entry and exit, exit was restricted. And that meant that service provider relationships between the person and the service provider were the sort of dominant form of relationships that people had. And that they had institutional characteristics. And interestingly enough, that's a sort of theoretical proposition, but it was something that was commonly said by a number of self-advocates who gave evidence and it was clearly uh, central to the evidence that the human rights lawyers gave. And I just listed there in black the characteristics that Canis uh, put in her evidence around, these are the characteristics of institutions that have been identified by the UN um, committee uh, around institutions. And these are the things that are replicated in group homes. It's interesting because that list is quite extensive, but it reflects to some extent how they've been characterized too in the in the liter in the empirical literature about having rigid routines, having block treatment, having uh, people being depersonalized, not being treated as individuals, and there being social distance between uh, people being supported and staff. Um, so, these three terms were, were, were very strongly talked about um, in the evidence from the human rights people. There was very little evidence about best practice. Um, despite the intention uh, to explore issues about best practice that was stated really clearly in the issues paper, it really had a very low profile in hearings and reports. Uh, despite the fact that many of the submissions made reference to some of this literature. Um, so in fact, good staff and good management and examples of good practice tended to be mentioned fairly fleetingly, but the, the examples of poorer things and bad things happening tended to sort of overwhelm that. Um, there was quite a lot of evidence about the alternatives to group homes. So there were positive examples that people talked about of people leaving group homes 
and going to alternative models of housing and support. But when you go through that evidence in some detail, you find that most of the people that were talked about were people with relatively low support needs. And the options that they went to were often drop-in support rather than 24-hour support. Many of them were designed for people with acquired disabilities. Many of them were new SDA builds, which had been which have been in, more populated by people with acquired disabilities than people with intellectual disabilities. And some of them, such as ILOs, required significant family support um, and it had a relatively low take up. What was clear, and the Royal Commission said it itself in its final report, is that there were there were almost no examples of alternatives to group homes for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. So as I said, there's limited, genuinely inclusive housing options for people with disability, particularly those with high support needs. Interestingly enough, a couple of paragraphs down, um, there was another statement that said, well, we've seen some good examples, uh, but it was really hard to track down what they were. So there was a bit of a sort of inconsistency through the report around that. So what did the DRC recommend? Um, the chair who sort of represented all of the commissioners talked about the weak implementation so the poor implementation of the group home model and the inherent flaws of the model itself. And he suggested that sweeping changes were needed and that there were recommendations made about um, improving, uh, reforming and improving practice in group homes. But from his point of view, the recommendations of the greatest significance were those about improving access to alternative housing options. So he was really clear that he, he saw the need for reform and the need for alternatives. And so the reform, there was a, a major recommendation 7.41 about reform, which basically said the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission uh, own motion inquiry and its action plan about best practice um, in group homes, which includes active support and practice leadership, should be hurried up and should be implemented and there should be new standards developed. It added to that that there should be a much clearer separation of housing providers from support providers and that practice models should be strengthened to create opportunities for interaction and community participation. So addressing this issue of isolation that people experience. The other half of the of the uh, recommendations were about developing alternatives to group homes. Um, and this was clear about expanding what was already happening, the NDI demonstration projects, having a policy unit which would guide the development of innovative models. And they talked quite a lot about the need for uh, research and evaluation and building models and then researching them to see if they could be scaled up. So they paid a lot of attention to that sort of implementation aspect of new alternatives um, and recognised that there needed to be reform and more flexible funding to make that work. And then the issue of, well, if you've got alternatives, how are people going to make decisions? How are people going to exercise choice to move? the need for more advice, advocacy and support for decision making to enable people to explore and decide about and take up those alternatives. So it was a really interesting sort of two sided set of recommendations. But there were very split views. Um, so four of the commissioners wanted to go further and to say that we all group homes should be closed within 15 years. And one of the commissioners said, well, we should just close them within the next generation. And the chair uh, took a, a sort of softer, but maybe more realistic approach, which talked about, well, we should retain group homes among other alternatives. We should be developing the other alternatives as a priority and slowly the demand will dwindle away uh, for group homes. So it was very interesting that 
this split of the commissioners actually got much less media attention than the other splits between the commissioners. So there was much more media attention about um, closing sheltered workshops uh, and closing special schools, as Teresa will talk about. Um, so what I want to do is really try and reflect then about some of the issues that arise from those recommendations and from the way the Royal Commission uh, regarded group homes. In many ways, what the Royal Commission said reflected existing policy directions, um, the direction of having alternatives to group homes, the direction of improving practice. But they said it in a much more powerful way um, and wanted it to happen at a much quicker pace than what was already happening. Um, and it reflected a very strong commitment to a human rights approach. And in many ways, their recommendations can be seen as, as a really good thing. So maybe that sort of bold approach to closing, moving on, is the way that paradigms change. And we might be among the first um, countries to, to close group homes. So it's a way of signalling that major change is going to happen. But from a pragmatist, uh, pragmatic or realist perspective, uh, some of the recommendations are fairly puzzling and, and a bit problematic. Um, in many ways, they take a leap of faith into the unknown that's driven by human rights theory. So particularly in respect to people with more severe intellectual disabilities, there really was a lack of evidence and a lack of clarity about what alternatives to group homes were. What did they actually look like? And if you read the report fairly carefully, they use different names, um, which is fairly inconsistent, but there's never a really good description of a blueprint for what these alternative, more innovative, more individualized housing options might look like for this group of people. Um, what, what there is, is the, is the need for research and for development and for testing new options and seeing how they work. And I think that's, that's very commendable, but the problem is that Australia has a very uh, long history of failed policy ambitions and poor implementation. So it doesn't really bode very well for the type of rigorous design, evidence building and evaluation that the commission was su suggesting um, should be uh, used in order to develop alternative housing options. What we tend to do is think, oh, that's a good idea, and then go ahead and do things fairly quickly. Um, and then realize, well, actually, we haven't done that very well, and then that's not working, and then look at another alternative. So there was also an assumption that the, anything that's not a group home, that's an alternative, more innovative housing option, would develop would deliver better options. Um, and there's no evidence about that. It's by no means certain. And I think we know that there are some better group homes. There are some that where people do have a good quality of life. And the idea of closing all group homes leads to the danger of losing the better ones that do exist. Um, and there's evidence uh, from previous uh, paradigm changes uh, where the new models that are developed often show a lot of variability. So the best of the new models are often much better than what's gone before, but they produce better outcomes. But the worst of the new models, in many instances, are actually um, not as good as the better ones of the old models. So for example, the best small group homes are clearly better um, on, the empirical evidence says they're better than the large institutions, but the worst small group homes have been proved to be similar or worse than institutions. So we're risking empirically that some alternatives may not lead to better outcomes. Um, now this risk of moving from one model to another and leaving the old model behind without retaining the really best aspects of it is also uh, referred to in human rights theory. 
Um, and this quote comes from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It says, there's a need to be prudent in the way support services are provided to people with a disability, because institutionalization can also happen in an individual's own home. And this is really important. It's pointing to the, to the need for the quality of support to be as important and maybe more important than the type of housing or the model of housing that somebody is living in. And that even if you're living in an individualized setting, you may still experience all those features of institutional services. And we've seen some of this happening at the current time um, in terms of our longitudinal study that we're, we've been working on for quite a long time now. We've seen examples of people living in individual situations where they're receiving really poor quality support, which has many characteristics of an institution. So the problem is that the Royal Commission gave very little attention to support practice in alternative models. Um, it's really clear from the theory and also from the empirical evidence that the quality of support must be given attention in alternative models, and it's as important as the model. But despite that, and despite the mention of housing options and support, in the introductory paragraph about the recommendation for alternatives, there was almost no consideration given by the Royal Commission about how practice reforms from the own motion inquiry um, would need to be adapted or would be applicable to new housing models, or how there might be different issues around safeguarding um, and practice leadership and good management in those types of models. So the focus of the Royal Commission was completely on the new models rather than on the practice that might go along with it. And if you were a cynic, you might read, read into that, that there was an assumption there that the new models would solve all the problems and that re recommendations about practice reforms would be redundant and would be superseded once group homes were replaced. And in many ways, I think that's what's happened in the early days of the NDIS, when the focus was on new models of housing, new SDA, which took precedent over the development of good practice, which, was, which has been neglected probably for the last 10 years. I would suggest that the NDIS review um, didn't make the same, um, the same omissions, and it did focus to some extent on the importance of practice. Um, it talked about smaller and alternative housing models, um, but also talked about the need uh, for having specific practice standards for the type of living supports that people would need in those models. So it focused equally on smaller housing models and on good practice within them. Very briefly, I think um, what the Royal Commission did was demonized group homes. Um, we, we saw a lot of negative terminology, a lot of negative stance to group homes. And that came out at the end in terms of these must be closed, they shouldn't be part of the system. And that has potentially negative consequences for the people that are already, already living in group homes and for their families and the confidence that their families might have. But it also has some implications in terms of funding reforms and changing practice that it's unlikely that some of the, the more innovative organisations will want to focus on improving the quality of their group homes when they've been labelled as an outdated model. So the danger is that people, organisations will neglect to improve the existing group homes. And that could have been avoided um, by linking the significance and the similarity between good practice in group homes to good practice in those alternative models so that the two practice elements were more clearly linked. And some of our research has shown that families of people with more severe intellectual disabilities are concerned about the quality of, of group homes. They're concerned particularly about staff turnover. Um, but in our relatively small sample of about um, 20 odd people, families were reluctant to consider moving uh, because they felt that would be unsettling for the person and there was no guarantee that there would be an improvement to the person's quality of life if they did move. 
So in a sense, the families um, were replicating some of the issues that I've, I've mentioned. And I think if we do close group homes, it will be very important to work with families and to bring them along um, to thinking about what a change might look like and what it might offer. And that's a re repeat of what's happened with institutions. Many families were opposed to closing institutions, but with really good support and having alternatives that produce better outcomes demonstrated to them, most of them were very happy at the end of the day uh, that their family member had a better life. So I think taking into account families where they stand is really important. Um, I won't go on about this. There was a very negative ideological stance towards um, group homes. They were stereotyped and many just sort of disparaging labels uh, were used in relation to them. And I think the point is that lots of assertions were made from a rights perspective, but none of those were interrogated really empirically. Um, there is very little evidence. And in fact, the evidence that is there suggests that institutional characteristics are necessarily found in many group homes. Um, there is some, but not many of them and certainly not in the better ones. So the Royal Commission missed an opportunity to actually look at some good group homes, to take an appreciative approach to thinking about what made them work, what can we learn from the things that are working well, and it focused on the things that weren't working well. Um, and it also failed to ask the three whys or the five whys, um, and there were lots of assumptions embedded in the way the Royal Commission went about its work, and it never sought out the deeper or more theoretical explanations for the aspects of weak implementation. Throughout the report, it talks about the problems of staff training, the problems of management, of culture, and so on. But it never says why. Why is it that frontline staff have such low pay and conditions and standing in the disability sector? Why are there no mandatory qualifications? Why don't our managers have to be trained? Why don't our frontline workers have to be trained? Um, why are there no required professional uh, accreditation for managers? There seems to be an assumption that um, it, those are just taken for granted assumptions of the disability sector. But actually, if you look at disability sectors elsewhere and group homes in other countries, in the Scandinavian countries, Many of those have three year university trained frontline staff. They don't experience the same issues around the quality of the workforce that we experience in Australia. But there was no mention or discussion of that, of a bigger reform that we might need in the workforce, which might address some of those problems around the quality of practice and the quality of practice leadership, which we're in danger of just simply replicating in alternative models of housing. And I would argue that commissioning some research on that, almost there, <laughs> um, might have helped to think about that a bit more deeply. So just finally, um, there's the issue of clarity. Everybody seems to assume that we know what we're talking about when we talk about group homes, but actually the Royal Commission used group home and supported accommodation interchangeably. Um, it talked sometimes about housing and support with four to six people. Sometimes it talked about just housing and support for people with disabilities, so it could be any number of people. And sometimes it talked about just four to five people in a house and not support, which is the SDA definition. Clarity and conceptual consistency really does count when we're sharing and looking at the literature from elsewhere and when people are trying to understand what the Royal Commission has said. But size also matters. The SDA rules are really clear that a group home is defined as four to five residents. It, or they also define six or more residents being called legacy stock. And legacy stock is not called group homes. And it was hardly mentioned in the Royal Commission because there's already a firm policy, maybe, that says we're gonna close anything that's six or more. But that was sort of, it was very silent around that. 
And there's some assumptions about size that smaller is better. And that runs through the Royal Commission and it, it's repeated in the NDIS review. But there is no empirical evidence that says anything smaller than six, that four, four is better than six or three is better than four. There's no empirical evidence for this issue of size other than we know that six or more is, is problematic in terms of quality and there's research evidence around that. So the NDIS review suggests that we should reduce the size of group homes to three over time and not build any more that have four bedrooms. And it's assuming now in its models, its new models, that there should be a ratio of one staff member to three people. So there should be shared support with some exceptions. I think this is something that needs much more consideration. It's really problematic for people with more severe and profound intellectual disabilities who need support to be engaged, who can't be safely left alone. And if they are, be, if they are left alone, if they're living in an individual unit, sharing support with two other people in two other units, they're likely to be left alone for considerable periods of time. Will there be a harm of, in terms of safety, but also in terms of engagement? For people who can't support the engagement for themselves, need staff around to support their engagement. So from that point of view, for this group of people, um, five people to two staff might be much more preferable. But we need some empirical evidence before we start determining which number is better. And at the moment, it just seems to be plucked out of thin air or be driven by economic issues. Um, one of the important things about the Royal Commission was it did prioritise people with more severe and profound disabilities. It talked about people with complex needs um, and it talked about people needing, uh, who had needed support with decision-making, who were ex-institutional people who had been most disadvantaged. And that's repeated in the NDIS review. But what's also clear from the Royal Commission is that there's very little robust data about who lives in group homes. Um, and it's clear that SDA doesn't equal SIL. SIL can be lots of things. So we do need some more data if we're going to close group homes and we're going to prioritise people with more severe and profound disabilities moving out, we need to know who are this group and where are they. Um, and at the moment, that there isn't good data there. So just to finish, I think it's time we stop talking about group homes because it's really unclear what we're talking about. There's a lack of clarity and they've been sort of stereotyped. The Disability Royal Commission could have been much more rigorous in the way it approached grouped homes. It could have had a much more balanced approach. It could have been clearer uh, and it could have made better use of the empirical evidence um, that was there. It actually uncovered very little about group homes that wasn't already in the literature. And that's something that I've heard people say about a number of particular topic areas. But I would say that the Royal Commission said it much more powerfully and to a much wider audience than the research uh, evidence can ever say. So in that sense, it, it was really, really important in terms of drawing out those issues about group homes. Um, it prioritized, it highlighted the need for change, um, the change to practice and the change to, um, to the model. Um, and I think there's a lot of, of, of optimism that what it recommended was repeated in the NDIS review. And I think going into the future, we're going to think more broadly about alternatives to group homes. And hopefully we'll think more broadly about the practice in whatever those alternatives are, but also make group homes while they do exist, uh, focus on the practice there. And the sort of long-term challenge will be the implementation of these alternatives and reaching the stage in Jim Mansell's sort of schema where all the outcomes of all alternatives to group homes are better um, than the worst group homes. And I think we've got a long way to go there, but we're, we're well on the way, I think. So I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry that's taken so long. <laughs> so welcome back to you all. We've got a lovely crowd of people here online with 70 participants, which is excellent. And it gives me great pleasure now in welcoming Professor Teresa Iacono, 
And Teresa is going to um, talk for talk for us to us about her critique of the Disability Royal Commission recommendations for a pathway to inclusive education, implications for students with intellectual disability. Welcome, Teresa. Lovely to have you here. Thank you, Jacinta. So um, Chris alluded to the fact that the headline news items when um, the Royal Commission report was about to be released included that special schools were going to be abolished. Um, but there was disagreement amongst commissioners. Um, and so um, sometimes these just create images in my brain. Um, I just have this vision of, so, you know, what's going to happen? Will kids, all kids get on the regular school bus um, and the, the minibuses for, that go to the special schools just won't be seen. Um, and, and thinking about, you know, if you have a child with disability, um, particularly intellectual disability, um, which bus does your child get to go on? You know, and, and as one of the commissions um, framed it, will they have a choice? Two of the commissions, rather, commissioners. So let's just talk about special schools. Um, what are they? What do they do? So um, they came to pro prominence when they shifted from kind of residential care um, and schools that were largely related to schools for the deaf or um, visually impaired uh, in the later part of the 20th century. And they used to teach an adapted curriculum, which some people characterized as teaching life skills and, and not academic learning. But the, now they do teach the Australian or adaptations of, by states and territories, but they tend to teach at what, what's known as the foundation level, which can be conceptualised as fun, free academic. Um, you can look at this figure of 11.9% in a couple of ways. You can say, well, only 11.9% of all students with disabilities are in special schools. Um, but there isn't much data on the proportion who do attend mainstream but experience some form of segregation or micro-exclusion. I'm going to talk about that in a few moment. But 19.7% of children with severe profound, so that should be intellectual disabilities, attend special schools. Um, so they're largely those with intellectual disabilities, often with co-occurring disabilities, in particular autism and cerebral palsy. And for those of you who know me in that, my area is communication and complex communication needs. We know that a lot of those children are sitting in special schools. And these are the kids, according to the um, National Collection of Consistent Data about students with disabilities, are categorised requir as requiring substantial and extensive support. So that the highest level of supports are required. And most, if not all, would be eligible for NDIS individual packages. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will have them because that will depend on whether or not families apply for them and as people will be aware of many other factors can come into that. So who does go to mainstream schools? So if we look at the flip of those figures, and this is all based on ARHW uh, data and people looking at the census, 88.1% of students with disabilities who are not homeschooled would go to mainstream. The question is, how many are homeschooled? And, and we know that the numbers of students who are homeschooled has increased quite a lot post-COVID. So we don't really, um, I read a figure that said 40,000 students across um, Australia, but the number of those who have disabilities and type of disabilities is hard to find. 80.3% of students with severe to profound intellectual disabilities who are not homeschooled, and again, we don't know, um, would, we think go to mainstream schools, but we don't really know what percentage of those are actually in mainstream classrooms as opposed to a special unit or classroom. And then you kind of ask the question, well, does going to mainstream school actually equate with being included? And the reason I raise this question is there's a tone in the commission reports um, that um, if you go to mainstream, you're included which is being debunked many, many times. Um, so my focus is on students with severe to profound intellectual disabilities, although it is hard to tease out some of the specific information about that group. You, you can certainly draw 
uh, implications from the recommendations for this group because they do tend to be the ones going to special schools that aren't earmarked um, as being for uh, the deaf or the visual impaired. And even those, those autism schools tend to have a lot of, if not most kids who also have intellectual disabilities. We know um, that there's an entrenched exclusion of all students with disabilities. And um, I think I had the same reaction as Chris did, and as probably many people did in reading the report, and that is kind of reading the same things over and over again. So we know um, that there is frequent practice of enrollment refusal or discouragement. That's the sort of argument that goes along the lines of, well, of course you can come to our school, um, but is it in the best interest of your child? Because we don't really have the resources or the expertise to support them. Um, and it's very interesting, like in, if we're going to talk about biases and conflicts of interest, yes, I'm biased towards inclusive education. Um, I've always been biased that way. I am particularly biased now having uh, an essay nephew who are autistic and experiencing many of these things firsthand, like being in a meeting with the principal and almost, well, absolutely being able to anticipate what was coming next and thinking, no, 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 they're not going to say this. Like, oh, yes, they said it. It's there, you know. Um, so, yes, I'm a researcher. And I'd rather base everything on evidence, but I'm, I'm getting that anecdotal experience. Um, partial attendance is frequent. So that's the um, sort of line that runs. Um, yes, they can be in class, but only if their teacher assistant or teacher aide or whatever term is used, education support officer, they come by different names, is here. So if you if the child has partial funding through the school system um, and that pays for three days or three part days of a teacher assistant, then the student can only be there on those days. A failure to provide re reasonable adjustments. So students are excluded because no adjustments have been made for them for their inclusion in a school activity or um, an academic lesson and whole host of things. Um, there's relinquishing the teaching to the aides in the classroom. So as I said, these, these people go by various terms. Um, and so the teacher basically says, right, you're the aide, you look after this child, you teach them, here's the lesson, figure it out, or here's the speech path, um, you know, exercises, just go and do those with the child. And so they, they're segregated in the classroom. They're, um, they are exposed to restrictive interventions. Um, and we've all heard those horrendous stories and they keep happening of kids being locked out of rooms or locked into rooms, uh, locked within spaces within in classrooms, like a cage, and, you know, and that, that hits, hits the headlines. Um, they're, they experienced harassment and bullying. And I should say that the restrictive interventions and the harassment and bullying happens in all schools. It's not restricted to um, mainstream. Um, and, and that harassment and bullying can occur by other students. It can occur from uh, staff within the school or from other families. Um, sometimes parents are asked to pay for additional supports within the classroom. Uh, Students with disabilities are often excluded from that plan, and that's around that position in your school, so that you know you're not looking to have a low result on that plan. There's ableism, which is um, not having expectations that a student can learn or participate. Um, there are no complaints mechanisms, or if they are, they're fairly superficial. Superficial, and there's exclusion from activities. Um, so. Again, I'm going to go to a personal experience where my brother said, I know you told me this would happen. I didn't believe it. But I thought the whole school had stopped swimming lessons. But it's just our kids, our kids being kids in the special classroom. And how do we know about all these things? Well, there's just been report after report after report. And here's a list of some of them. Um, and I did a paper 
uh, that was published in 2009, where we kind of looked at national um, policy and uh, legal obligations against reports um, showing that people were not complying. Um, so the and uh, we focused in particular on Victoria. So the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission did a report in 2012. There was also a Victorian Auditor General report. Um, the Disability Standards of Education, which is supposed to um, be the guidelines for implementing the Disability Discrimination Act, is reviewed every five years. And each review is showing these things keep happening. The Senate Standing Committee of 2016 showed all these things were happening. And Coed et al. did a really nice study where they took, you know, the summaries of these types of exclusion and did a, a national survey to find out how extensive these were happening. And basically they were found that they were happening across all states and territories, all educational jurisdictions. Um, and they happened a lot. And in Victoria, they did a review of their program for students with disabilities, which came out in 2016. And I've got Dr. who probably keep showing this, which I kind of did graphically. I tried to portray this in a project that we were doing uh, a few years ago, where I kind of just put everything on the timeline. And you could extend this out, sort of the dot, dot, dots to the Disability Royal Commission, which basically is showing the same things over and over and over again. So um, when I was reading the report, I had that sense of, you know, this is just more of the same and it's it's harrowing. Each report is harrowing. It never gets less harrowing. Okay. It, there was a human rights uh, framework that or ideology that was followed, but also pulling on legislation. We have very we have legislation that says or, or um, human rights policies. Um, so the UNCRPD 2006 Article 24 states that children with disabilities should not be excluded from primary and secondary education that's free and compulsory on the basis of their disability, should not be excluded from the general education system on the basis of their disability, must be given access to education on an equal basis as their peers without disability. And unfortunately, that's been open to interpretation. But the Disability Discrimination Act, Section 22, basically says that, that students cannot be discriminated uh, against on the basis of having a disability. And the Disability Standards for Education is the guidelines that are meant to um, enable education jurisdictions to, to make sure they're complying with the Disability Discrimination Act. So we've got the policies, we've got the human rights um, you know, um, driver, if you like, and we've got the, the law and the uh, policies. So let's just focus again on the evidence presented to the DRC. So uh, there was a real focus in, of Queen, on Queensland and ACT in terms of where they held hearings, held their hearings, etc. Um, so they had three public hearings in those in that state and territory. They had private hearings and submissions. I haven't numbered them. <laughs> it had its own commissioned report. So this a study by McBilly et al. where they compared outcomes for people across inclusive, segregated, and integrated settings. Um, and they did a lit review and a Delphi study where they presented the themes that emerged to you know a panel of experts and asked them to comment, basically finding there was a lot of disparity in what people thought about what was inclusion, what was segregation, what was integration. And, and this is reflected in the, um, the recommendations from the commission. Murray in 21 um, did analysis of Australian legal and policy frameworks across jurisdictions and basically found there's a lot. And it all says students cannot be discriminated against, um, but there's always a little clause, there's always a little out. Um, the Commission used NDIS data to explore outcomes for participants according to their schooling location uh, on um, whether or not or how they transitioned to work through modelling using the outcomes framework. And they found basically it's not great for kids who've been in special schools. Spivakovsky et al. did a review of the literature 
um, that focused on uh, the, the literature and the review of the submissions about restrictive interventions, not specifically in schools, but certainly included a lot of information about schools. Uh, and the Commission also looked at Australia's compliance with articles, um, Article 24, sorry, with the articles of the UN uh, CRPD, but Article 24 is of relevance to inclusive education, following Australia's appearances between, uh, before their committee, and, and basically found that we're not compliant. So key issues. When I read the report, um, and also in terms of how they grouped their recommendations, um, were the disagreement about what comprises inclusive education, what's segregation, and what's integration. You know, in, you know integration um, and participation was kind of the model that people first looked at when they were talking about participation in um, community spaces or non-disability spaces. And in, and in the states did a lot of work in this area about getting students, especially students with most severe disabilities into mainstream schools um, and had uh, some amazing um, models of integration, but found that it didn't actually reflect inclusion. It didn't reflect um, an acceptance of students with disabilities or uh, adapt, adapt, adapting to their needs. Um, the, the other key issue is that uh, there are poor outcomes for students who attend mainstream versus special schools, um, especially in terms of getting access to employment and open employment. There's stigmatization arising from othering, and this is this results from a whole lot of things. Um, but I'm just singling out a couple of uh, contributors, and that is the role of teachers' aides. I'm not, I'm not um, trying to demonise teacher aides. They are an amazing resource, and when used, when used well in the classroom, can make a real difference for both the teacher, so for the teacher, for the student with disabilities, and for the broader classroom. But when attached to a student, and given responsibility for everything that student with disability does, what they do is they effectively segregate the student from the other children. And the research is supportive of that. I'm sorry, it shows that. NDIS supports, um, it's really an interesting space. And um, many of you, many of people in this audience will probably be familiar with this notion of my child or a child has an OT, an occupational therapist or a speech pathologist that's paid by the NDIS they go into the schools and withdraw the student for their therapy sessions. And so again, the student is singled out. And McBilly et al noted that these kids are started to be labeled as the inclusion children, which I found very disheartening when I looked at. Um, the restrictive interventions that I've mentioned obviously lead to trauma and abuse and are uh, forms of coercion and control. What I didn't see in the report was any real exploration of um, how people in positions of power, such as teachers uh, and principals, get to a point where they, they feel they have to coerce and control. Like what is it that we're not providing those teachers? Um, certainly there's a lot of work being done from the trove, but not only around supporting teachers through trauma-informed um, interventions. So having them really come to understand what a trauma-informed approach is about. And that allows um, reflection on their own reactions to behaviours that challenge us. And, you know, and I think we have to be realistic. If you're a teacher in a classroom and a child is kicking you or spitting at you, you're going to have a reaction um, which will blame the child, see that child as not just problematic, but quite um, quite evil for my for, you know, I'm not trying to be emotive, but you know that being uh, the recipient of aggression will evoke a particular reaction in you. And I think the trauma-informed interventions help teachers understand that. Mm. But this is not addressed 
by the Commission Bill. Um, there were key, and I should say, or in the reports that I read that informed the Commission. Uh, there's a lack of data on how often principals might refuse or discourage enrolment about restrictive interventions and their impact on the child. There's a lack of data from the national, nationally consistent collection of data about students with disabilities, which came out of Gonski, for those of you who are wondering where that came from, where we started talking, well, Gonski was talking about needs-based funding in terms of, well, we have to understand the needs of students with disabilities. So they started collecting data, but not in relation to some of the specific characteristics that the commission was particularly interested in such as age, but also our First Nations status and LGBTQI plus, and how the funding's been used. So the NCCD asked teachers to um, evaluate the level of um, supports or accommodations or adjustments that students uh, need in their classroom. So how many students need extensive adjustments and then it goes down the track. Um, and then they get funding based on that but there's no data on how the, that funding is used. Um, and there are no really effective or clear complaint, complaints mechanisms. So if we look at the recommendations, um, you know, I, and I've thought a lot about how to present this because I don't want to just kind of talk them, you know, just list them. I think you have to. Um, and they're grouped into areas. So there are 15 recommendations that relate to inclusive education. Um, but not all of them can be implemented because the last two are mutually exclusive because one is about abolishing um, special schools as the, the um, model of segregation and the other is about keeping it. So you can't do both. Um, so under overcoming barriers to safe quality and inclusive education, so 7.1 was about making sure students have equal access to mainstream education and enrollment. So that's around uh, implementing the Disability Discrimination Act, Act, preventing gatekeeping, that, you know, example of, yes, you're entitled to enroll here, but um, keeping records and independent review process. So having a, a, an accountability mechanism built in. Um, 7.2, preventing inappropriate use of exclusionary discipline, except as a last resort. As soon as you have an except, you open, it, there's this crack which says, you know, I can keep going down that line because I have this, this um, option that says, I can use this because recommendation says I can use it as a last resort. How you define last resort? Well, they talk about if there's danger of harm to the student or people around the student, for example. Um, use of behaviour support plans and reasonable adjustments and considering the needs of the child. Novel. Um, and principals have a duty to report the use of restrictive intervention. So again, trying to build in some sort of record keeping as a means of accountability. Um, 7.3 was about policies and procedures about reasonable adjustments. This is an interesting one because it's about reminding people that they have obligations under the DSE, it's called the DSE 2005, but it's updated frequently, about their duties uh, around legal compliance requirements, but also their duty of care, well, the school system's duty of care, the funding and supports that are available to schools um, and also giving students and families equal access to consent to relationships and sexual sexuality education, including for LGBTIQA plus and neurodiverse students. And making sure that schools have tools and resources to adapt to curriculum and support culturally, culturally safe adjustments. 7.4 is about participation in school communities. Now this one, I have to tell you, does not help. Co-locate non-mainstream with mainstream schools and create partnerships between the two. Um, and participation of non-mainstream um, students in various activities with mainstream. So it's kind of like, okay, we get 
But if you just put a mainstream school next to a segregated school, osmosis is not going to help. You're not going to suddenly get inclusion. So you've got to do something a bit more active. Um, but this, this has been happening for a long time, co-locating mainstream and special schools. And in Victoria, students can be enrolled in both a special school and mainstream school. But we're still seeing all those examples of um, restrictive interventions and micro-exclusion. Um, 7.5 was concerned with making sure that uh, students have some sort of supports to move them into post-school options. Um, and 7.6 was around student parental communication relationships. So um, acknowledging that the relationship between families and schools can get quite fraught. Um, so they wanted updated and improved policies, participation decision-making, co-design. Um, it's interesting under the First Nation, when thinking about First Nations, they wanted a consultation process um, and there was almost an acknowledgement that there's a lack of um, skills and expertise around First Nations. And so we need a unit that sits within government that can advise. Um, and the Australian government to update the DSE 2005, which I kind of found was interesting because they review it every five years. So I assume if you review something, you update it. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Um, these next set was around embedding inclusive education. Um, and this is around not ed uh, inclusive ed education units in schools, but rather at the government level. And also those that will address First Nations expertise and provide advice to schools. 7.8 is about building workforce help capabilities. So embedding human rights into teacher professional standards, kind of interesting, is it not embedded? Like, do they not talk about human rights? It's not, I don't, I, I do guest lectures for teachers, but that's about it. Um, continuing pre professional development in inclusive education, and also the use of lead specialists. Um, now, a lot of these recommendations talk to things that are in the literature, but without really drawing on that. Um, so lead specialists, for example, there's, there are quite a number of studies that show as soon as you put a, anyone that has any knowledge or expertise around disability in the classroom, there tends to be a relinquishment of responsibility to the person. So rather than um, engaging or, I mean, the lead specialist may want to engage and coach the teacher, but unless there's a model and a way of working put in place, that's not what happens. You know, um, that again, there's just, oh, you're here, great, you deal with that child. 7.9 was around, we need data. Um, we need evidence. Uh, around what is best practice and how to build best practice, as though that doesn't exist. Frustrating. Um, so they wanted consistent and comparable NCC data. So even though this is collected across the states, they wanted to make sure they got consistency and how that's reported. Um, annual reporting across uh, states and territories and jurisdictions that goes to the education minister's meeting. So, so these are all the ministers from across state, territory and Commonwealth. Um, and publishing data um, that is provided to them, but also commissioning the Australian Education Research Organisation to build and translate evidence. Now, I looked up that organisation, the AERO, you may be familiar with it, I wasn't. It's a ministerial owned company governed by a board they're jointly funded by the commonwealth state and territory governments and they conduct research and share knowledge to promote better educational outcomes for australian children and young people they were established um during god's two that's all. sorry i just haven't had a chance oops i'm gonna finish that to explore them in very detail uh, 7.10 was about complaints and management. They wanted complaints officers that were independent from schools. So really addressing this sense that 
that parents and family and students often have, but if I complain, I might have a, a worse deal. I might get punished when I get the treatment from the school. Um, they wanted in 7 11 stronger oversight and enforcement of school duties. Um, ensuring this was a, like, let's remind people of their ob obligations. Let's remind them that there are complaints procedures and that complaints can and should be made. Um, that we will collect data about exclusion, restrictive practices, and funding used for students with disabilities to make sure it's being used appropriately. And then 712 was about improving funding. So looking at the NCD, NCCB levels and how funding is associated with um, that, those levels and reviewing the loadings every five years. They're also calling for transparency in how that funding is used. I think that's a really good point because uh, I've often heard um, principals on, you know, on radio saying, we're not funded to provide for these students. And you're like, yeah, yeah, NCCD funding. You know, it goes to the base funding. Of course you are. Uh, 7.13, National Roadmap to Inclusive Education. This seems to have borrowed from the National Road uh, Roadmap that was in existence in, independent of the DRC around health. And that was instigated by a number of um, uh, researchers and uh, uh, health providers and people with disabilities um, through a fairly long process of advocacy and research. So they're kind of, I think, reflecting that same type of approach. Um, and that the education ministers would, would um, we will report progress in relation to the DRC recommendations. And then here we have the two mutually exclusive. Um, so achieve inclusion while fa phasing out special or segregated education settings. And that's three of the commissioners, two of whom have lived experience of disability, say that special schools and also special classrooms within mainstream schools are incompatible with Article 24. So we're not meeting our obligations to the United Nations Conventions for the Rights of Persons with Disability. So their phasing out includes no new buildings to be approved from 2025, no new enrolments into existing special schools from 2032 or placements within special classrooms from 2041. No students remaining in segregated schools by the end of 2051. Mason and Ryan said, really believe that if you got rid of special schools, you get rid of choice for families. I found this an interesting argument because it's they borrowed from NDIS language about choice and control. I don't know if families really do have choice because we know we know there are many families who've had poor experience in both systems and have ended up homeschooling. Um, so having choice doesn't necessarily give them control over what's going on. So they wanted to keep segregated. Language shifts in the DRC reporting from special schools to non-mainstream. I suppose it catches everything, um, including the special units within the classroom. They see uh, that inclusion would be uh, improved by co-location at the school. Um, partnership, facilitation, and participation, that goes in both directions. So it's not just the school, the children from non-mainstream coming into the mainstream, but the kids from mainstream going into non-mainstream. I'm just aware of time, so I'm going to move on. Encouraging support, completion of school, and obtaining open employment. So my critique, um, sorry, I can't see what I'm doing for that. Controls. Um, my critique is really around uh, kind of feeling like we've been on this merry-go-round and we're going really fast and trying to reinvent a broken wheel. You know, like these are old solutions for old problems. I don't see any any real change. Um, the evidence is really clear that we're not complying with Article 24, which has called for a process of systematic reform embodying change and modifications in content, teaching methods, approaches, structures, and strategies in education to overcome 
barriers with the vision serving to provide all students of the relevant age range with equitable and participatory learning experiences and the environment that best corresponds to their requirements and preferences. Similar to a point raised by Chris in relation to group homes was that they didn't really document positive practices. They listed some, but they didn't really do any good exploration of why they're positive, what contributed to their, pos their positiveness, and what are the outcomes of those positive practices. Um, and, and I think this is because once you have these types of rural conditions, then all those horror stories, and every time you ask the question, you will get, because they're there, I and mean, it's the reality of it. These practices keep happening and the impact on families and students and the wider community is quite traumatized. But there are good things happening and we're not seeing those. Um, many of us will be aware of them. I'm aware of more and more positive practices, one through my personal experience, but also because I'm doing, I have a couple of honours students where we're actually starting to uh, interview teachers and our health professionals. And we go, wow, there are some really good things happening in the field. Why didn't we hear about it? Um, and these are some of the examples that were listed. Allied health professionals assist to ensure adjustments in the classroom are appropriate and effective. The co-location was seen as a positive practice. Investment into specialist teacher roles that help adjust curriculum and address problem student behaviour. We're still putting the blame of the child. Um, some of these practices were seen to me a legacy of um, what was known as more support for students with disabilities, which the Gillard government brought in. Um, there was over $300 million allocated across states and territories and jurisdictions from 2012 to 2013. It makes me, you don't see any reference to this. It makes me wonder that if in 10 years, people will be going, what Royal Commission? You know, it will have just disappeared from our radar. Anyway, people had demonstration, uh, organisations, um, schools, jurisdictions, um, implemented demonstration programs and tried to do not a great evaluation because the time was quite limited, but there was at least some attempt to talk about what they did and what the outcomes were and, and what were the problems. Um, and there has been some, that report is still available. I did a Google search and was able to find the report. Didn't take much. Um, there's some evidence of sustained implementation. So, you know, this thing around making sure that people are aware of their obligations. There's an e-learning program that's available um, about the DSE and it's through the NCCD uh, website. It's there. Okay. It's available to any any education staff. Uh, the abilities based learning and education supports, which is assess is an assessment uh, program, if you like, for students with quite significant disabilities. So, and there are others, I'm sure. So, my sense when reading the, the DRC is that what's missing in action is an overarching evidence based model. It's kind of a, just this ignoring of what's already out there and has come from special education that's about not where you teach, but how you teach or how you include. Um, the multi tiered systems of support is um, that model. And it's, you know, you'll, you'll be familiar with this model because it keeps appearing in various forms. So at tier one, it's the, the um, adjustments that you make through universal design for learning, which is meant to capture diverse needs. So how do we teach these lessons or have these um, social activities within the classroom that really address, you know, a, a variety of needs? And you, you keep data, so that's this line up here, for response to intervention. So how do students with disabilities or other needs respond to those, to that universal design? Mm, still struggling, let's 
pop up to tier two, which is what if we give them supplementary supports? And that can include things like having a, a, some group sessions that are focused on particular learning needs that you found out about through good data collection and seeing how, how students are going within their academic learning. So still having problems? All right, now we're gonna pop up to tier three where you become much more individualized. So that could be the special ed teacher or the speech path or the OT or whoever doing that one-on-one -on -one intervention. But what's different is that these higher level interventions are always with the aim of returning the student back to the mainstream classroom. You see it, the, the more uh, nationally consistent collection of data on school students with disabilities kind of reflects that same model. And the other thing that seems to be ignored, which because uh, I've led a, a team of researchers where we really try to explore this, where we kind of go, okay, what if we have collaborative consultative, consultative teams? It's not a new concept. It's been in the literature for many years. It's come out of the special ed literature where you involve parents and teachers um, and other experts to work together to assess student needs, do some problem solving, come up with adjustments that are based on what the student needs and you involve the student wherever possible. Um, and you avoid decisions that are based on funding. And um, in one of the studies that we did, we brought together stakeholders from those groups. And we found that their initial discussions were around thinking about whether or not this was an NDIS kid or not. So, you know, what funding they brought into the classroom was, was governing decisions and we tried to kind of break that up. And, and I'm gonna say we did that successfully. We didn't do anything, we just let a group dynamic occur. Um, and we and how do we integrate NDIS and classroom-based supports rather than thinking about who pays for what, what are supports are what supports are available to this child. Um I'm just about to run out of time. Um, the Victoria has been implementing a really interesting approach to supporting students with disabilities. It's not perfect. Well, we don't know yet because we don't have the outcomes yet. But why did the Disability Royal Commission ignore it? Um, so they've, uh, they've allocated funding across three levels. Level two and three are new. One's about workforce capacity. One's about support for individual students with high support needs. So that's going to capture a lot of our kids with severe profound disability. And they set up supported inclusion schools. So they're looking at a model where they've designed mainstream schools to integrate those specialist provisional provisions, which I think is a great idea on paper, but we just don't know if it's working yet. And hopefully they'll build in evaluation. So my conclusions is, yes, I think the merry-go-round has kind of stopped, maybe, but not from what is in the Disability Royal Commission. It's happened. It, there is evidence of it elsewhere. Um, yeah, so I just, I just, it's kind of, the Disability Royal Commission just missed a whole lot of stuff, just really sad. So I think special schools will remain as perceived as being better options, particularly for students with severe to profound intellectual disability, given that the classrooms have low student-teacher ratios. There's a concentration of expertise. Like in Victoria, special schools have teams of allied health professionals. Allied health professionals were ignored by the Disability World Commission in relation to education, which does, you know, which kind of is my problem. They have greater access to technological and other resources. Um, and if we don't change the societal attitudes that blame students for having these extra needs, and we stop putting responsibility solely with teachers, we're not going to shift this. You know, we're not going to shift. And I hear it time and time again. I hear people in the public saying, well, you know, there's a kid with all these needs and he's really difficult to manage. And so what are you going to do? You know, take him out of there and send him off to a special school. And I hear that time and time again. And I think the commission recommendations lack to creativity. Sorry, I'm just thinking about that. 
And they really didn't explore good models. And they are out there. And I think that's just part of the design of how Royal Commissions are set up. They're set up to hear the terrible stories. Um, but they didn't, you know, even in the reviews that were done, where were the overarching models that selected, that reflected a social model? The other, that's the other thing about special schools. They continue to um, kind of further a medical model, even um, individual education plans around identifying deficits and addressing those rather than how do we include. Um, and they didn't consider how you bring expertise that's out there and resources into rather than next to mainstream schools. These are just some references that will be included um, in the, um, the slides that will be available. And that's my point. Um, Thank you very much, Teresa, for again, as our first pre presentation with Chris was incredibly informative, um, really thought provoking in many, many, many ways. Um, I just want to indicate that our next um, seminar is going to be, as always, on the second Wednesday of the month, so on the 10th of April, and we'll have two fabulous speakers yet again. We'll have Alan Hoff and Laura Hogan presenting um, on that day, Alan, about safeguarding it, and Laura is presenting about, Chris, can you remind me? They're both presenting uh, critiques of the Royal Commission, so yes. Alan Hoff will present around a critique of how the Royal Commission looked at safeguarding and Laura around how it looked at allied health. That's right, yes. And how, yes. So, again, really um, both incredibly interesting presentations. I look forward to them. So thanks again and thank you very much to our audience. And as I say, most we have lots of people saying thank you so much for excellent presentations. Have a good evening, everybody, and we'll see you on the 10th of April.